Welcome to people who are joining. Uh, we're bang on 12 o'clock, so we're just going to give uh, people a few extra minutes to join and then we'll get started with this session. Thank you to those of you who are here already. Okay, we'll just give it one more minute for stragglers to join and then we'll get started. Thank you for bearing with us. Okay, Emery, are you ready to rock and roll? Okay. I am. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Darren Walter from the University of Manchester, and with me today is Dr. Imri Shatner Arnon, who will speak in a few moments uh, from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. The format for this session is uh, I'm going to take a lead and give you a little bit of a description of uh, our MSc in humanitarian practice. And at stages, I will drop out and invite Imri to step forward and talk about the Liverpool side of our partnership. As this, this presentation will take about 30 minutes. And when we get to the end of it, uh, we will throw things open for questions. And between us, we will ping pong answers to the questions you may raise about uh, our MSc in humanitarian practice leap uh, in partnership with Medicines Sans Frontières. So when the technology works, uh, what this is going to be is a webinar talking about uh, leap the academic year 21-22, so entry uh, in September of this year for, um, for students starting in September. We do have twice yearly entry, 
for the part-time programme, for the full-time programme, its annual entry in September. And as always with um, starter slides, you can see all the partners at the bottom, and we're all equal partners in this MSc in Humanitarian Practice. I'm going to give you a little bit about HCRI, then let Imri tell you a little bit about LSTM, then cover some of the background of the LEAP and our online programmes, talk to you about what you will study while you're with us, and a little bit more about what's involved and how the programme works. As we get to the end, we'll throw it back to you. And if you type your questions in the Q&A, they will appear uh, unlikely, going, unlikely to interrupt the flow of the presentation, but they will appear as a list of questions for us. And Imri and I can see those questions. Uh, Lucy, our administrator in the background, will be keeping tabs and keeping us on track and making sure we don't miss anything important but she's shy and she's turned her camera off. Okay. HCRI was founded 13 years ago, 2008, uh, in response to a demand for a center of excellence for humanitarian action. Those of you involved in the humanitarian sphere will be aware that for the last two decades, there's been a push for professionalization and development of humanitarians and HCRI rode that wave back in 2008 with its start. The aim was to bring together academics, practitioners, and policymakers to facilitate improvements at that time in crisis response. But crisis at that time was regarded as a sudden surge in need. And we're increasingly recognizing that crises can be longer and more drawn out. So the initial big bang response that initiated HCRI has become a much more drawn out and more prolonged uh, approach to. University of Manchester uh, has three driving agendas and social responsibility is one of its driving agendas. And HCRI, a truly multidisciplinary environment is social responsibility in, in action. We bring together humanitarian aid, disaster management, conflict response, and international development together. And just last month, the University of Manchester was Times Higher Education um, Impact ranked globally as number one in terms of its social responsibility. Uh, our president and the deans have been really quite keen to impact the fact that Manchester is number one. We need to blow our own trumpet. Our strengths uh, is the multidisciplinary nature. And as you look down our corridor, our virtual corridor at the moment with COVID, but our real corridor offices has history, anthropology, sociology, politics, international relations. You might be surprised to see drama there, but it has some particular relevance to post-conflict recovery and geography but the applied sciences are also evident. I'm emergency medicine and global health. Those of you who've looked me up on the HCRI site will see that I'm still a practicing clinician, but we also have epidemiology, nursing, development, peace and conflict and education. We really are very broad. And that explains to a degree why we're found in the Faculty of Humanities the School of Arts, Languages and Culture. That's just an administrative line of accountability. We cover the, we cover the full piece as described on this visual. Our unique selling point, um, particularly for our online programmes, is the fact that we're doers. We are early implementers of online education. It's dynamic and evolving indeed in Four weeks time, I've got a meeting that's going to completely revamp our global health line, but LEAP is currently in its evolution. There are decisions this week about the next four years and the developments of the LEAP project being decided. Indeed, they've been decided on Friday. We're responding to the need 
of the humanitarians, but we're also actually doing it. The images there show uh, Bertrand Taith, who's a cultural historian, but currently our director, who was the initiator of HCRI. Tony Redmond, who is the chairman of UK Med, the U described from our Department of Health as the NHS PLC. It is the deployment of the UK NHS overseas, and Tony Redmond was the initiator of that. And Roni Broman on the far right there, at the time HCRI started, was president of MSF. And they were the driving force behind what is HCRI. So we, we feel we are unique among the UK academic institutions in terms of our doing it rather than just talking about it. Uh, our online suite uh, includes global health, humanitarian practice, what we're talking about today, but also international disaster management and humanitarian response. And we have lots of flexibility with core modules and flexible modules, and more about that later, because LEAP has really pushed the boundaries in terms of flexibility. We are a globally diverse community. Yes, we're a university, well, we're a pair of universities based in the northwest of England, but this graphic shows where our students are and where they currently are. We struggle a little bit with some of our time zoning, particularly with uh, students in New Zealand and just clipped off on this screen capture, which I apologize, we have a student in Alaska, getting the time zones for synchronous teaching can be difficult, which is why a lot of our activity is asynchronous. And again, more of that later. And over to you, Imri. You'll have to tell me uh, Chris Whitty style to change the slides when you're ready, uh, because I've got control. Away you go. Thank you, Darren, and uh, hi to everyone. As Darren said, uh, my name is uh, Amy Shapman. I'm a senior lecturer in uh, humanitarian studies in LSTM, and I'm also the academic lead from the Liverpool side for the LEAD program. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, uh, it's a much smaller institution compared to the University of Manchester, but also much more dedicated. We are a uh, a school that specializes in research and, and education on issues of global health, particularly in what we call uh, the Global South. Uh, and we are celebrating our 125th anniversary, I think, um, next year, um, or, even, or even this year. Um, so so uh, we've, we've been around for a while and we have a lot of history on that. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Please, can you? Great, so yes. Uh, Yes, that's great. Um, the LSTM was, was uh, founded you know, at the end of the, the 19th century, um, which was at the time the oldest tropical medicine school uh, in the world, um, before the London one, which is, um, came up uh, a little bit later. Uh, the origin of LSTM is interesting because it, it came with the sort of the, the arrival of, uh, of people uh, and, and of, of transport to Liverpool, which was a big, uh, maritime hub and with those people came new diseases that were unfamiliar and they came tropical. Uh, obviously there's, there's a complex and interesting history to all of that uh, that we, we engage with. Um, LSTM was and is a health related research center and it's sort of really focusing on, on uh, tropical or the global south as, as we, we call it now. And we have some core competencies, for example, international public health, um, tropical disease biology, which looks at questions like uh, parasites and different vectors like malaria or other diseases that are much more common than, than here in uh, Western Europe. And we have a big department of clinical sciences where a lot of our staff are also working as clinicians uh, in Liverpool and around Liverpool. Um, the humanitarian program, which is what I belong for in, in, in what uh, LEAP uh, sort of uh, works with in, in uh, LSTM is actually not very recent. It started in uh, 2002, which is quite, uh, quite uh, old for UK uh, humanitarian studies. So we've been around for a while and we've sort of uh, developed our reputation and also uh, formed quite a lot of alumni um, through that. Um, 
Now we, we do come from a, from a public health approach, but we try to bring in our, our innovation capacities, our research, you know, a lot of what LSTM does is, is about uh, disease related research and clinical research. We focus on neglected diseases. Um, I haven't mentioned it here, but actually there's the, the biggest collection of uh, venomous snakes in Europe, I think in LSTM. So uh, if you're very interested in that, uh, which, which might sound funny, but snake bite is a huge issue uh, worldwide uh, and, and often neglected. Um, so there's that as well. Uh, but increasingly, we'll be looking at questions of uh, maternal and child health in, uh, in poor settings, um, and pushing for um, better evidence, better research, uh, and more practical solutions for, for global health issues. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, as I said earlier, we are a small institution in a sense. We only provide uh, postgraduate certificates, uh, which is certificates, diplomas, and, and uh, master's programs, and obviously PhDs. Uh, but we also run quite a few smaller uh, dedicated uh, courses for nurses, for example, or for uh, physicians who are interested in going to work in the humanitarian world. And through that, through the years, I mean, um, we've, we've established a lot of um, contacts with um, relief organization, development organization, because a lot of people have gone through our programs. Likewise, we have uh, strong collaborations in, in many um, global South countries, uh, Ministry of Health, international organization, et cetera, et cetera, um, as people have gone through these various programs. Um, now, more recently, we have online and on-site. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about the sort of the differences between these uh, later. So this is really just a short introduction to, to LSTM. I think what's important to keep in mind is that we're, we're focused, uh, research, uh, research led and sort of uh, health conscious uh, institution with a long history in, uh, in uh, developing world uh, politics about the man, the health issues and an increasing global concerns. I think that, that's, uh, that's an overview of LSTM and, and I look forward to telling more about this in a bit. It's back to you, Darren. Thank you. So um, that gives you an overview of the two uh, partner, two academic partners, and we are literally 50-50 in terms of, our, of your academic involvement um, with both institutions. So why humanitarian practice then? Humanitarian practice means a lots of things to lots of different people. There is, um, I'm not going to misquote the source, but those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. We often see the big bang events, the famines, the, the movement of people, but it's undoubtedly uh, relevant that conflict and population movements are causing many of the crises in the world today. And some of the pictures at the bottom illustrate the international NGO responses, but a particularly pertinent at the moment is the uh, COVAX initiative. There are huge humanitarian and global health movements that are part of our world of practice these days. And in terms of the LEAP project, we try to throw a net over all of these and bring in academics from all threads of our multidisciplinary environment in both institutions. Some of these pictures are ones that I've taken. And when we look at the resources, we typically regard the Global South as being short of resources. This ambulance is clearly going to take some time to be ready to respond but respond to what? To the cramped living conditions in some of the local, in, the, the low income settings can be a real challenge. And addressing healthcare is not necessarily like dealing with healthcare in a high income setting. The average age of the population in Africa is at or around 20 years of age, as opposed to Western Europe, where it's in the mid to late 40s. And that's just the mean. If you start to look at the demographic profile, there are huge differences in the nature of the populations, but also 
in the demographic transition, the dietary transition, and the health transition that are ongoing. If you're going to be involved in humanitarian practice, you need to properly understand the populations that you're going to be trying to provide support to. Mohammed Yunus, who was behind the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, was quoted as saying, one day our grandchildren will go to museums to see what poverty was like. We talk about poverty, and this graphic is one of those world mapper ones that shows you where absolute poverty is currently concentrated. But in my last 10 years, absolute poverty was one US dollar per day, $1.25, and currently $1.75 is the line at which absolute poverty is drawn. And it is changing the dynamics. And when you're responding to parts of the world, you need to have that in mind. Where is absolute poverty? What does poverty look like? It's changing. And Dr. Yunus, Professor Yunus is quite right that within two generations, what we currently consider poverty will look very different. Dalgren and White had talked about the determinants of health 30 years ago and um, the socioeconomic, cultural and environmental conditions are really important. It's not just about dropping field hospitals into disasters. We need to consider lifestyles. During the Maru River Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we learned how important social and community responses are to responding to humanitarian crises. This is constantly evolving, as is the access to technology and fancy graphics, but the social determinants of health uh, part of the healthy population drive, healthy people drive from WHO shows you that economics, cities, social and community context, education are just as important to supporting communities in their response to disasters and crises as the provision of healthcare. And in our academic approach, we will get to throw the net wide. So when we talk about some of the modules, it's not just about getting out there and putting up tents in disasters. It's much more fundamental, just more foundational in terms of strengthening the response. It's also about the global context. We had the Millennium Development Goals from 2000 to 2015. We could debate and will debate whether they were effective, yes or no. But we're now into, we're just coming out of the first five yearly review of the SDGs from 2015 to 2030. The Emergency Care System Framework, which has come out of WHO in Geneva, I've been involved with, and it brings you brings to mind how it's everything from the local people responding in the community right through to the hospitals and the rehabilitation. The vast majority of people rescued in a crisis are rescued by their neighbours. Their lives are saved by the people who are already there. Not the international field hospitals that get loaded on a Boeing 747 and flown across the globe that land at an airport, decamp from the airport, are transported through a destroyed road infrastructure, put up their field hospital, and are then ready to receive patients. The UK EMT won't be ready to treat its first patient for six to seven days. Lives are saved by the people on the ground. We need to build emergency capacity, help the community be better able to help itself while the international humanitarian assistance comes. And when it arrives, what does it come with? Is it airway breathing circulation, emergency healthcare, or is it about shelter, education, protection, food, clean water, hygiene? There's a place for all, but what's the balance and how do we manage it? That's what we'll take you through.
And just to close off on the uh, SDGs, the UN is celebrating its 75 years of existence, whatever you may think of it. And there are those who say it's worked really well, and there are lots and lots of critics. But I would say to you, if not the UN, then who and then what? And what more than the SDGs? Yes, there are, criti there are critics of it. No, it's not perfect. But we work with what we've got, and we need to stand on the shoulders of what's been done to date to better deliver for the people in need. So what is our programme? If you sign up, if you start with us uh, in September, we are looking for engagement during the time you're on your modules of 15 hours per week. It's asynchronous learning. And by that, we mean you don't have to be online at a particular time on a particular day. We require you to drop in several times a week to engage in the material that we put up and in the conversations that are happening in group discussion boards uh, in, in your module throughout the duration of your module. Some modules have synchronous activity. And for the LEAP project, there are four core modules which have intensive periods, an intensive two week period that will require you to be online for eight hours a day for each of those uh, two days a week of two weeks. So it's really quite tight and bolused. With many of the other modules, there's a lower level of engagement uh, of synchronous meetings, but it's well planned and you can diary it. So the engagement is a mean, an average of 15 hours a week, typically asynchronous with some synchronous bits that we can tell you about when you sign up to the modules. A module is typically eight weeks with one week at the end of the module to complete the assess work, which is the inevitable part of university study, I'm sorry. And it runs over 36 weeks a year. We do, we are generous. We have a one week break for Christmas and a one week break for Easter that falls as it will with the scheduling of the modules. But we're talking to you today about a start in September that will run through to June. And it'll be 36 weeks uh, plus those extra two weeks. Students say, well, how much does it cost? Well, the program part-time is spread over three years and the standard university fee is 10,000 pounds for the masters. Um, so the fee is divided over three years, but your fee will be that of the year you register. So there will be no inflationary increase for you in year two, year three, if you sign up. For academic year 21-22, we also have a full-time option that will deliver over a year. So that's 10,000 from September to September. We currently have 150 students in our part-time program. We've only been offering the full-time option for one year. This will be the second year of full-time options. And we currently have five full-time students in our options. They spend their time or they will spend their time as a mix in Manchester and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. You choose to live where you choose to live, but there is a train line that runs from Manchester Oxford Road to Liverpool Lime Street that takes about 30 minutes and it is a short walk from both campus to the key stations. It is easy to get from Manchester to Liverpool. I hesitate to say efficient, but it's pretty good. English language. We have an international student cohort because of our partnership with MSF and many of our students come to us as MSF country officers and country staff 
we do have to mention to you the English language requirements. It requires an ILETS or equivalent with an overall grade of seven with a minimum writing score of seven. We do have a translation system that's run by admissions for many of those who have something other than ILETS. But we also have an English language waiver process that's earned its spurs over the last year with COVID because many of the British Council institutions where the overseas students, the international students go to undertake their English tests have been closed with COVID. Um, so we do have a waiver process. And if you're a candidate that requires that, um, we would be pushing you to try and get your ILETs. But if you can't, we do have an officially endorsed bypass process to issue you a waiver and the details for that are on the application website. So the programme outline. I need to start by pointing out the LEAP project was built part time over three years. If you get 60 credits, you're eligible for a postgrad certificate. 120 credits, which takes two years, you're eligible for a postgraduate diploma. And if you do the full masters, you do a dissertation in your final year, that's 180 credits. And you would graduate with, a master, with an MSc in humanitarian practice. And your certificate would be from both Manchester and Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. The projection is that you do eight taught modules of 15 credits in sequence, and then your dissertation. And before Imri jumps in, many of the Liverpool modules are a combination of 20 credits and 10 credits. And when we get into the fixed and the optional modules, the key is the amount of credit, not the number of modules you achieve. So 60, 120, 180, and then there's flexibility. There are core modules. These are the modules that you must do. The critical approaches to the management of humanitarian emergencies, uh, the critical approaches to evidence, history of humanitarian aid, and research into practice are each 15 credit bearing modules. If you do them part time, we would look to get you to do them in this sort of sequence. If you do them full time, the reasons the reasons a research into practice research methods thing there is to make sure you can get it all done in one year. But those 60 credits are the core. In terms of the options, which is the other 60 credits of your talk components. In essence, you can do almost anything either of the two institutions offer. If you're on campus, your selection is much broader. If you're doing it purely online, it's a little narrower, but you will need to do about four or five modules and you would be choosing if you're doing it distance learning only, it's 17 or 18 modules you're choosing from. If you're doing it face to face, and you can blend face to face and online, but if you're going to be on campus, your option choice runs to about 28, 29. And the reason I'm being slightly vague about the total numbers is there are some commonalities between LSTM and Manchester, and you can't do the same thing at both Liverpool and Manchester. That'd be cheating. Um, or you wouldn't get the learning <laughs> that we would like you to have, so we broaden it out. But you get to choose from the full spread of what HCRI and Liverpool uh, offer. I can see uh, somebody's just asked a question about the core modules being available fully online. All the core modules are delivered fully online but each of them has the intensive period, which is a two day intensive period over two consecutive weeks. So CAMHO, the Critical Approaches to Humanitarian Emergencies, 
has two days in week six and two days in week seven, which fall in November, where we will require you online full time. The same falls for critical approaches to evidence, which runs in semester two, which is going to fall towards the end of March. Likewise, history of humanitarian aid. We can give you the schedule, but yes, it's being done fully online. You, if you're doing the PG cert, you will do two core modules on enjoying your uh, 60 credits. So you do a, a half and half. Okay. I can see other questions coming in. I'm going to kick those down the line and we'll deal with those at the end because they're more generic. The dissertation, the key message for the dissertation is it's student generated. In some institutions, they give you the dissertation topics to choose from. We don't. Imri and I have just supported uh, the first part time LEAP students through their dissertations, we've just allocated their dissertation supervisors, and we've had a fascinating collection of choices, um, but they've come from the students and they reflect the students' interests and professional backgrounds. We have a dissertation module over eight weeks where we help you create and refine your question, consider the ethical issues, and then allocate an appropriate supervisor. On of our eight students, four have come to Manchester and four have gone to LSTM. You then work with the supervisor over the following months to create a dissertation, a thesis. You can do primary research, you can do secondary data research, on data that's already being gathered, but about two thirds of the students do secondary literature analysis. They do not need to do primary data work or using data sources. We are a broad church. We will help you create a dissertation question that meets the full requirement for a master's dissertation. Right now, because of COVID, the University of Manchester Research Ethics Committee is discouraging primary research just because you can't travel and you can't undertake the data collection face to face. But that will be rescinded, certainly by the time anybody part time is getting to the dissertation. Um, but we do we do encourage all three tracks of dissertation. There are some university rules. I've mentioned the certificate, the diploma, the masters with the credit. There is a five year maximum from start to finish. You can interrupt, you can uh, take a break or select only one module at a time. And indeed part time, we encourage people only to take the amount that they can give the proper commitment to. This is not, this is a marathon, not a sprint. If you do it full time, it really is full time. You will be doing four modules at once. And for those of you who can do the maths, that's 60 hours a week of time we're expecting. It is a full time commitment to get it done in a year. But if there are issues, we can exceptionally look at whether we allow it to take more than five years. But the university rule says thou shalt do it in five years. Of course, life gets in the way. We have interruptions, life challenges, flexibility. Some of our life challenges, my favorite interruption, uh, the university asks for some evidence and the student who interrupted her dissertation sent me uh, a picture of a baby with an incubator and a birth certificate and said, my baby arrived a few months early, can I interrupt? That was the most convincing evidence for an interruption I've seen in my time at the university. But we've also had lots of interruptions for COVID. We even had some, those of you who are in the humanitarian sphere already will have been aware there was a big fire in the Rohingya camps in Cox's Bazaar. And I think five, possibly six students contacted us and said, we're really struggling to keep up with our studies because of the surge that's happened with the devastating fires in Cox's Bazaar. Can we, can we mitigate, can we interrupt? And the university basically just said, 
yes. When are you going to ready to come back? We are very flexible. We are very open. And the university system has got used to the fact that humanitarians may suddenly find themselves deployed to a new area or there's been a change in circumstances and we just need to roll with it and adapt the program for the students. We do that and Imri and I are the drivers behind that and we haven't had any pushback from the university yet. All our requests have been reasonable and the university has said yes to all our requests. Our first students are coming off the end of our, I was about to say production line, that sounds very automated. Our first graduates are coming out of our programme. Our graduations have unfortunately been virtual over the last year, but these are students from uh, the UK, Europe, and even from the US who came for the what would turn out to be a very expensive glass of pims and lemonade. But you do get to wear the, uh, the, the mortarboard and gown, and we would love to see you and welcome you to Manchester for a graduation in humanitarian practice. Where do our people go? The LEAP programme is in partnership with Médecins Sans Frontières. A lot of the students you'll be working alongside, and this webinar is for non-MSF students, so those of you who are here are not MSF based at present, but our graduates from our online programmes go to the NGOs, to Oxfam, Red Cross, Save the Children. Many of them are already MSF and are doing their career development. Some of our students have gone to the civil service, to research institutes and think tanks, such as the OCS Development Institute, the Centre for Global Development. I do know of a couple who are now in the United Nations and one who's in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And we have, um, we have graduates who are working for the AU uh, and the EU and those who have done it from the Caribbean have been involved in the Organization of American States. Manchester has a pretty good, strength, good track record of its graduates going to employment and it's running, I think it's 88%. I don't have the figures to hand uh, for LSTM. I'll pass across to Imri in a moment, but we've got a pretty good track record at HCRI. We do bring the students together uh, for the intensive periods, but with COVID, we have not had them here with us for the last 12 months, and we're not going to be bringing people together for the next 12 months, we don't believe. But you can see our first cohort of students when they came together for the intensive period. We've now reached the point where I finished jaw jawing and we're going to ask, we're going to approach the uh, answers in the chat area. Now, um, Imri, I'm sure you can see. Do you want to take, now, because this is being recorded, we tend to anonymize the questions as we answer them. So people's identities are not showing in the reflection. Imri, can you see the first question in the Q&A session? Yes, certainly. Uh, let me try to answer that. that so, one? yeah, it's a question about whether this program is appropriate for people um, who are new to the new to the oh, it's disappeared and uh, new to the NGO field or looking to get involved but have no prior experience. Um, so first, let me explain that Leap the Leap program is is aimed for people with some limited but some experience. Uh, Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, but we expect uh, students to have at least six months, six months, yes, of field experience. Um, they don't need to be working at the moment, and that six months doesn't have to be continuous six months with one organization and one assignment. It can very much be uh, you know, something uh, over a few years. Um, so, um, and that doesn't have to be with an NGO. It can be with a multitude of other, uh, other uh, situations. Uh, but in a sense, it's a program that is meant to help those that have some understanding and very initial um, experience to sort of develop professionally and, and improve their practice. 
both LSTM and HCI have other uh, very specific programs that are very much dedicated for people who have less experience and are interested in, in, uh, in entering the field professionally. So, so I really uh, encourage you to sort of uh, find the program that is best for you. Um, the, the fact that it's also initially a part-time program is because it's meant for people who are currently um, in, in assignments. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll be happy to provide you uh, from both ends interesting uh, information about our programs uh, and just reflect on the one that's most suitable for you. Now, Darren, if you want to add to that or? I, the, we, have, we have talked to the LEAP partnership about having something that's entry level for people. LEAP is not really entry level. And what I would say to people is if you genuinely are completely new and you haven't got any Global South experience, either in humanitarian activity, NGO activity or development activity, you will struggle in the LEAP environment. And I would direct you HCRI wise towards the um, MSC in humanitarian conflict response or disaster management. And I know LSTM has humanitarian practice programs and they may be more appropriate than the LEAP project if you're brand new. I've just been talking to a couple of undergraduates from our disaster management program uh, who when graduate want to go straight into masters and their sole experience of global health was some pre-university gap year time painting schools in East Africa. And that really wasn't the sort of thing that is sufficient experience. It's really quite difficult to critically review your experience and the challenges you've faced uh, if that's all you've done. And some of those questions are things we've explored. So if you are completely fresh, have a look at Manchester or Liverpool's uh, humanitarian practice, humanitarian conflict response master's programs, rather than the LEAP project. Okay. The next one, is the course well regarded by employers in the humanitarian sector? Imri, you come from the humanitarian sector. I'll let you take that one. Yeah. Um, so, so um, the, the, I would say yes, I would say that the, the the course, the, the program is very well regarded because it is developed with humanitarian professionals. I mean, uh, it is mostly developed with, with MSF. Um, and, and it is also, there is a sort of, um, certainly in the optional model, but not, not just, there is a sort of a, a bias towards health related humanitarian activities. Um, that answers a little bit the question for me. It's only limited to that, but that's the, I would say uh, a thread that is important, um, but we'll get more to that in the second question. But because it's developed with a very active and well-known humanitarian agency, I think it's very well regarded. And I think we've had very positive uh, input from other organizations um, working in the field. So um, yes, I would certainly say yes. And, the, and the maybe, maybe of, to sort of bounce on the other one. The list of employers Sorry, I gave the list of employers I gave at the end of the presentation was Manchester graduates who've done humanitarian practice. They're well received. Uh, the LEAP program started in 2018, so we have a relatively small cadre of alumni at present. So it's a difficult question to say, our, our graduates have gone to this, this and this. But I, I share Imri's view that the skills that we're providing uh, will be well received by the employers. And, and also to, to sort of balance on that, a lot of the graduates or the students are already engaged. They either had their previous experiences and they've taken time off for studies or they're doing this as they're doing assignments. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, the, that particular question is a bit hard to answer at this particular time because the program is relatively recent and a lot of the graduates were already employed. Um, but the feedback we have is, is positive. Also. Okay, that same questioner asks, do any of the optional courses cover child protection specifically? If you came to, if you came to work on campus, the answer is absolutely yes. Antoine Bergard does a module specifically on 
child protection in humanitarian emergencies, uh, but that is delivered on campus face to face uh, and is not an entirely online program this coming academic year. We are moving to a position where we can offer everything both online and on campus. Um, but Antoine's module specifically does address the child protection. Um, it's actually the basis for his PhD, and um, he is one of the international experts in that. That's Antoine Bergard, for the person who asked the question, you might want to Google him uh, and have a look at his publication outputs. Yeah, maybe to sort of bounce on that, as I said, there is there is a sort of, um, I don't know if bias is the right word, but health is a big part of this program in a very large way. We're not looking at health from a clinical or medical point of view. Uh, we're looking at issues of water and sanitation, shelter, uh, access to rights, which is obviously a question of protection. Um, but there is a sort of a lot of the, the, the core models are, are sort of um, interested in the question of health, which is a huge issue in humanitarian, uh, humanitarian operations. I mean, my own experience, I'm not a medical uh, professional, but was mostly in health related organizations, even with organizations that focus on refugees or protection. Um, so we offer a very wide approach for, for um, people interested in, in humanitarian and have some experience. Uh, but um, it's it's not thematic, you know, if you want to, to study education, then you can take specific models that are dedicated to that. Health you will have overall. Okay. An acknowledgement, I think it would appear we might have answered the questions that were asked. Um, when they did my teacher training, they said, you say, are there any more questions? And then you count very slowly to 10 to see if there are any more questions. We've got through the list of questions that have come in through the Q&A and the chat function. I'm going to say, are there any more questions? Modules for the PG Cert. The modules for the PG Cert, um, you, you need to do two of the four core modules. And we would encourage you to do research into practice slash research methods in your diploma year. So we would be encouraging you to look at two of three critical approaches to the management of humanitarian emergencies, critical approaches to evidence and history of humanitarian aid. Though it will be two of those three in your first, in your certificate year and then you could do three, but you would need to acquire 60 credits and you would get 15 credits for each of the core modules. And then you can select the other modules to bring yourself up to 60. So that answers the question about modules for the PG cert. Two core modules, a minimum of two core modules and select the rest. Okay. Um, Oh, the anonymous attendee inquiring fees. Uh, if you're an international student, the international fees uh, are listed on the application website and are double those of the UK national fees. The full, the full program uh, is um, within one year. If you're doing it part time, the full fee is spread over three years but the rate is fixed at the year of entry. Um, so I'm just reread that query because it's quite a long query. Uh, it is in the presentation, but I use the UK national fee numbers, not the international fees, which for the Manchester Liverpool partnership are twice uh, the UK national fees. Um, one time full program fee. If you come for one year, then it's spread over one year. If you come for three years, it's spread over three years, but the rate is fixed at entry. Yes, that answers the question. Okay, I'm gonna to start to count to 10 in my head slowly again. And I'll prompt Imri to think about his closing comments while I do that slowly.
Okay. Imri, have you got any closing comments that you'd like to make? Um, yeah, but I'll keep them short. So a couple of things maybe. You know, we, these, these are um, a bit of uncertain times. Some people are unsure whether they want to invest in a, in a master's degree or whether you know, this is the right one for them. Um, and some people are not even sure what, what the, you know, the future in humanitarian uh, would be. Um, my experience has been, I, I was a field humanitarian. I, I did a program not dissimilar to this, but uh, for those without experience, and then I entered the field. Um, and, and I think that was the, one of the best choices I, I've done. And, and I, I'm a firm believer in the humanitarian cause. And I think what we've seen, as Darren mentioned, that the humanitarian has become more professional. That means that the people who have entered but have not had the qualification uh, are hoping to get you know, further qualification, more insight into the work. And those that are entering the world are, are looking to do it full qualification. You need to think carefully where you are in this. And, we're also here to advise you. I mean, if you're not sure whether your experience would qualify you, then come and contact us. Um, you know, we, we're here to help. We're, we're interested in sort of having a rich body of, of students and, and finding with you what is the most uh, suitable for you. So that's one thing. Don't hesitate. Don't sort of say, oh, I don't think I have the six months experiences they mean, so I'm going to go to something else. Come to us and then we'll sort of, we'll, we'll we we'll try to understand, and if we feel like that, then we can orient you towards uh, Manchester, HRI, or, or Liverpool, which have very good programs. And I think that's the second thing I want to say. These are very good universities. You know, we're looking at you know top universities for this year worldwide, as you've seen in the Manchester sort of uh, global impact um, ranking, and 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 Liverpool sort of long time experience on that. You 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 struggle to find better than us, honestly, without blowing our trumpet too much. And if you are a practicing humanitarian, this is an experience for working with other humanitarians, with top leading organizations, um, and in a very sort of custom way that is looking for you. So um, honestly, uh, I would jump on the opportunity and um, we've had very positive feedback, so I'm sure you will enjoy it. So looking forward to seeing you. And then Darren, it's back to you. Thank you. Um, Imri comes from a humanitarian background. As I indicated, I'm an emergency physician who comes very much from a health and development background. But my passion is for distance learning. We, are, we have been at the front edge of distance learning. And for, for us, COVID, while it's been a crisis, has been a real gift. We have uh, moved our distance learning environment forward three or four years in the last 12 months because of the momentum and impetus of moving things online. Our environment is evolving in front of our eyes. It's much more dynamic, much more interactive, and our students are much more dynamic and interactive than they used to be. If your previous experience of online learning was read these PDFs and answer these assessments, that's what my master's was, um, when I did mine online, that is not what you'll be experiencing. To get the full value of being part of a LEAP program, you need to sign up and be able to engage on a weekly basis and be engaged in a dynamic environment with people who are actually doing it. It's not just theory, it's many of the students in your environment are in humanitarian settings are doing it and are talking about things that you're seeing in the news and even things you're not seeing in the news yet. Um, you may or may not be aware that there is something that's being labeled a genocide um, developing in Tigray um, right now. Some of you have may have seen the news from Afghanistan about the death of people uh, who are working for the Halo Trust demining in Afghanistan. These are people who are actually doing it. We are contemporary, we're real time. We're exploring the challenges real time in this environment. Makes us relatively unique. But at the end of the day, we need to be a fit for you as well as you are fit for us. There are no absolute no's. There's an offer from both program directors to come 
talk to us and we'll have a one-to-one -one conversation with you if necessary to help you decide if we are the right thing for you and if you are the right thing for us. And on that note and that invitation to anybody who wishes to talk to us, can I thank you for your time and attention this British summertime, lunchtime, whatever your time zone is, thank you for your time with us. Lucy has put up a message that says a, a recording, a link to the recording of this webinar will be sent out to you uh, in a processing time. There's always a little bit of a lag while Zoom processes these things. They will send it out within 24 hours so you can double check what we've said and reach out to us if there's anything further we can do. Thank you for your time. We hope to see you one way or the other. Good afternoon. Great.